Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, there is a chapter entitled An Onion, in which a story relating to God's judgment is told. The passage relates as follows. I shall begin to cry, I shall, repeated Grushenka. He called me a sister, and I shall never forget that. Only let me tell you, Rakuten, though I am bad, I did give away an onion. An onion? Hang it all, you really are crazy. Rakuten wondered at their enthusiasm. He was aggrieved and annoyed, though he might have reflected that each of them was just passing through a spiritual crisis, such as does not come often in a lifetime. But though Rakuten was very sensitive about everything that concerned himself, he was very obtuse in regards to the feelings and sensations of others, partly from his youth and inexperience, partly from his intense egoism. You see, Alyosha, Grushenka turned to him with a nervous laugh. I was boasting when I told Rakuten I had given away an onion. But it's not to boast I tell you about it. It's only a story, but it's a nice story. I used to hear it when I was a child from Matriona, my cook, who is still with me. It's like this. Once upon a time there was a peasant woman, and a very wicked woman she was. And she died and did not leave a single good deed behind. The devils caught her and plunged her into the lake of fire. So her guardian angel stood and wondered what good deed of hers he could remember to tell God. She once pulled up an onion in her garden, said he, and gave it to a beggar woman. And God answered, You take that onion then, hold it out to her in the lake, and let her take hold and be pulled out. And if you can pull her out of the lake, let her come to paradise. But if the onion breaks, then the woman must stay where she is. The angel ran to the woman and held out the onion to her. Come, said he, catch hold and I'll pull you out. And he began cautiously pulling her out. He had just pulled her right out when the other sinners in the lake seeing how she was being drawn out, began catching hold of her so as to be pulled out with her. But she was a very wicked woman, and she began kicking them. I'm to be pulled out, not you. It's my onion, not yours. As soon as she had said that, the onion broke. And the woman fell into the lake, and she is burning there to this day. So the angel wept and went away. So that's the story, Alyosha. I know it by heart for I am that wicked woman myself. I boasted to Rakuten that I had given away an onion, but to you I'll say, I've done nothing but give away one onion all my life, and that's the only good deed I've done. So don't praise me, Alyosha. Don't think me good. I am bad. I am a wicked woman, and you make me ashamed if you praise me. And now, children, let me tell you a story about Buddha, Shakyamuni. It so happens that one day the Lord Buddha was strolling alone in paradise. All the lotus blossoms blooming in the pond were like perfect white pearls, and from their golden centers wafted forth a never-ending fragrance, wonderful beyond description. Day was just dawning in paradise. In due time, the Buddha stepped to the edge of the pond and beheld an unexpected sight through the spreading lotus leaves veiling the water's surface. Directly beneath the lotus pond of paradise lay the lower depths of hell, and as he peered through the crystalline waters, he could see the river of three crossings and the mountain of needles, clearly as if he were viewing picture slides through a projector. His gaze came to rest upon the single figure of a man named Kandata, writhing in the depths of hell along with the other sinners. This great robber had done many evil things, a murderer and an arsonist, with numerous robberies to his credit. Yet it seemed that Kandata had performed a single good deed. Passing through the middle of a dense forest one day, he noticed a tiny spider creeping along the roadside. Thereupon, he immediately thought to trample it to death. But as he raised his foot, he suddenly reconsidered, saying, No, no. Small though this spider may be, it too is a living creature. Somehow or another, it seemed a shame, too cruel, to take its life without reason. And so he spared the spider, and let it pass unharmed. Now, as he observed the situation in hell, the Buddha recalled that this Kandata had spared the spider, and decided, in return for having done just that one good deed, he would reward him for it by rescuing him from hell, if at all possible. 
By lucky chance, he turned to see a spider of paradise spinning a beautiful silver thread atop a lotus leaf, the color of shimmering jade. Gently lifting the spider's thread into his hand, he lowered it straight down through the pure white pearl-like lotus blossoms into the distant depths of hell below. Here, in the lake of blood, in the depths of the lowest hell, with the other sinners, Kandata endlessly floated up to the surface and sunk back down again, again, and again. Wherever one looked, there was only a pitch-black darkness, and when a faint shape did pierce the shadows, it was the glint of a needle of that dread mountain of needles, which only heightened the sense of doom and helplessness. All was silent as the grave, and when a faint sound did break the silence, it was only the feeble sigh of some sinner. Those who had fallen this far had been so worn down by their tortures of the other hells that they no longer had the strength to even cry out. Great robber though he was, Kandata could only writhe about like a frog caught in the throes of death, and he choked on the blood of that lake. And then, children, what do you think happened next? Yes, indeed. One day, raising his head, Kandata chanced to look up toward the sky above the lake of blood, and saw the gleaming silver spider thread, slender and delicate, slipping stealthily down through the silent darkness from the distant firmament, as though afraid to be seen by the eyes of men, coming straight for him. Kandata clapped his hands in joy. If only he were to cling to that thread and climb up and up, he would surely be able to escape from hell, and perhaps even enter paradise. Then he would never again be driven up the mountain of needles, or plunge down into the lake of blood again. Having this thought, no sooner crossed his mind, Kandata grasped the spider's thread with both hands, and started climbing up with all his might, higher and higher. As a former master thief, Kandata had plenty of experience at this kind of hand-over-hand -hand rope climbing. However, the distance between heaven and hell are untold thousands of leagues apart, so it was not easy even for a man like Kandata to escape, though try as he might. As soon as he began to tire and couldn't raise his arm for even one more pull of the thread, having no other choice, he had to stop for a short rest. As he clung to that spider's thread, he looked down far below. At that moment, he realized that all his climbing had been worth the effort. The lake of blood was now already hidden in the depths of the darkness. Even the dull glint of the terrifying mountain of needles was far below his feet. If he were to continue at this pace, it might not be as difficult as he had imagined to climb his way out of hell. Twinning his hand in the spider thread, Kandata laughed in a way he had not in all the years he had been in hell. I've done it. I'm saved at last. And then what do you think he saw? Far down below on that spider's thread, a countless number of sinners had followed after him, clamoring and climbing up like a column of ants. The sight struck and froze Kandata with such shock and fear that his mouth gaped open and his eyes rolled about in his head like an idiot. The slim spider's thread strained and seemed like it would snap from his weight alone. How could it possibly support so many people? If that thread were to break, then the egotistical Kandata himself would plummet back down into the hell he had at great pains struggled to escape. How terrible that would be. But even then, as he spoke, from the pitch-dark lake of blood, an unbroken column of sinners squirmed up the fragile gleaming thread, not by the hundreds, nor even by the thousands, but in swarms. He knew he would have to do something now, or else the thread would break in two. Kandata screamed at them, Listen to me, you sinners. This spider's thread is mine. Who the hell said you could climb it? Get down. Get off. And at that very moment... The spider's thread, which until then had been perfectly fine, broke with a snap just where Kandata was hanging from it. So Kandata too was doomed. Before he could even cry out, Kandata fell slicing through the air and spinning like a top, and in the wink of an eye plunged head first down into the darkest depths of hell. Behind him all that remained was the dangling short end of the spider thread from paradise, delicately glittering in the moonless, starless sky. Standing at the edge of the lotus pond in paradise, the Buddha watched everything that had happened. And when, in the end, Kandata sank like a stone to the bottom of the lake of blood, he resumed his strolling, his countenance tinged with sorrow. Kandata had thought to save himself alone, 
and as just punishment for a compassionless heart, he had fallen back into hell. How shameful it must have seemed in the eyes of the Buddha. The lotus blossoms of the lotus pond of paradise, however, were undisturbed, not concerned in the least about what had happened. They swayed their perfect pearl-white blossoms near the feet of the Buddha, and from their golden centers wafted forth each time a never-ending fragrance, wonderful beyond description. I think it must have been close to noon in paradise. So what exactly is happening here? Did Dostoevsky take an ancient Buddhist tale and Christianize it to include it in the Brothers Karamazov? Does one of the 19th century's greatest novels involving themes of the spirituality of Orthodox Christianity have Buddhist influences, changing a peasant's onion into a robber's spider? No, actually it's rather the opposite. The Brothers Karamazov was originally published as a serial in The Russian Messenger from January 1879 to December 1880. Dostoevsky himself would pass away February 9th, 1881. So what about the spider's thread? Can it be found in an ancient seminal Buddhist text? Perhaps the Pali Canon? Again, the answer is no. The Spider's Thread was published in 1918 in the Japanese children's magazine Akai Tori, written by Ryusuke Akutagawa. Akutagawa is regarded as the father of the Japanese short story, even having one of Japan's most sought-after literary prizes named after him. Akutagawa himself was known for taking inspiration from various sources in his stories, both Western and Japanese in origin. The Brothers Karamazov would receive its first English translation in 1912 by Constance Garnett, and Akutagawa was known for devouring Western novels. Does this mean that Akutagawa wholesale stole the tale from Dostoevsky and made it Buddhist? Not exactly. For while the spider's thread as we know it today comes from Akutagawa, the spider's thread first appears about 20 years earlier, not in Japanese or even in any language associated traditionally with Buddhist regions, but in English. Paul Karras, a German-American author, editor, and student of comparative religion, and while considering himself an atheist, he was one of the key figures in introducing Buddhism to the West. Karras believed the world needed a new religion of science and concluded that Buddhism was closest to his ideal. In 1894, he penned The Gospel of Buddha, in which he tells the story of Buddha modeling it after the New Testament, blending and inserting available English translations of Buddhist writings, adjusted and amended, making substantial changes to suit his purpose. The Gospel of Buddha was a seminal text to Western understanding of Buddhism, resulting in the Buddhism we see today in the West, even influencing modern Buddhism in the East, when the book received a Japanese translation. This, however, is not the only time in which Karas repurposed Christianity for a Buddhist text. In 1887, published in a journal called The Open Court, in which he was the managing editor, Karas wrote a story titled The Spiderweb. The Spiderweb would later be included in his 1894 book Karma, A Story of Early Buddhism. Karma would receive Japanese translation in 1895, 1896, and 1903, where we see Akutagawa found and adapted the story into the one we know today, as early 20th century Japan cared little about copyright or intellectual property ownership, especially when it came to translations. The difference between the spider's web and Akutagawa's adaptation are very minor, such as instead of the Buddha seeing Kandata and taking it upon himself to lower the thread, he and Kandata converse, and Kandata recalls his sparing of a spider. Kandata's fate at the end remains the same, but Akutagawa truncated the ending, focusing on a scene of the Buddha resuming his stroll among the uncaring lotus blossoms, while Karas explains the moral of Kandata's selfishness, his egotism damning him. While the spider's thread is clearly filled with Buddhist imagery, if when listening it appeared to be strangely Christian in its morality, that's because ultimately it has its source in Russian and Orthodox spirituality. It would seem odd to think Kandata would be able to achieve paradise directly from hell instead of the cycle of rebirth after the effects of his evil karma had expired. While in the Christian tradition we have stories of saints and angels interceding on behalf of sinners to rescue them. In fact, the central conceit of the Christian faith is Christ dying for the sins of the world to save mankind. 
From a cursory look of Japanese media, the story of the spider's web seems to be similar to parables such as The Boy Who Cried Wolf here in the West in teaching themes of basic morality. The story has seemed to have firmly cemented itself into the culture of Japan since its publication, an otherwise Christian story wrapped in the clothing of Buddha becoming a significant part of Japanese culture. If you have ever played Nintendo's Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, for example, one dungeon, the Ancient Cistern, is clearly inspired by the story of Akutagawa. The central room of the dungeon has a statue of the Buddha, surrounded by a clear pond of lotus blossoms, with a spider-like Skultula enemy scattered throughout. Below the clear waters and the Buddha is a deep cavern of a dark lake and the zombie-like cursed Bokoblin enemies. The clearest evidence of inspiration is within the hell-like caverns, atop a mound of skulls and bones, a single thread dangles above it, and when Link climbs it, it leads him back to the pure waters, lotus flowers, and the Buddha above. Though, despite the clear inspiration of the spider's thread, I do quite enjoy how the dungeon, aesthetics aside, ignores the entire moral of the story, with there being no repercussion to killing the Skultulas and needing to knock the cursed Bokoblin enemies off the thread as you ascend back to the surface. And even the boss of the dungeon at the very top is the Buddha-like statue animated and possessed by evil energy. Though completely unintentional, a Christian parable inspiring an area in The Legend of Zelda in an odd way harkens back to the series' original roots, wherein Link was a practicing Christian and the Bible was an item in the game. As an interesting aside, Leo Tolstoy, a contemporary of Dostoevsky, while he would later read The Brothers Karamazov and enjoy it, in fact, it was the last novel he read, requesting the second volume ten days before his death. He was initially unable to read it, commenting, I couldn't finish reading it. Not only do they speak the language of the author, they speak in some kind of strained, made-up language. When the Karma of Karas appeared in the columns of the open court, Tolstoy was enamored by the text, translating it into Russian, saying, quote, this tale has greatly pleased both me by its artlessness and its profundity. The truth much slurred in these days that evil can be avoided and good achieved by personal effort only, and that there exists no other means of attaining this end, has here been shown forth with striking clearness. The explanation is felicitous in that it proves that individual happiness is never genuine, save when it is bound up with the happiness of all our fellows. From the very moment when the brigand, on escaping from hell, thought only of his own happiness, his happiness ceased and he fell back again into his former doom. This Buddhistic tale seems to shed light on a new side of two fundamental truths revealed by Christianity, that life exists only in the renunciation of one's personality. He that loses his life shall find it, Matthew 10.39, and that the good of men is only in their union with God, and through God, with one another, as thou art in me and I in thee, that they may also be one in us. John 17, 21. I have read this tale to children, and they liked it, and amongst grown-up people, its reading always gave rise to conversation about the gravest problems of life, and to my mind, this is the very best recommendation. While Tolstoy mentioned that he had translated the work, he did not mention an original author, leading many to believe it was a genuine Buddhist text, perhaps the PC initials on the cover referencing a Pali Codex. From Tolstoy's Russian translation, it spread throughout Europe, receiving translation in other languages, French and German, each under Tolstoy's name, before even being translated back into English in America by the International Magazine, that too bearing the name of Tolstoy. As to whether the Karas or Tolstoy translation reached Japan first and caught the eye of Akutagawa for his adaptation, we may never know. Karas, upon discovering his story under Tolstoy's name, wrote to him, Now I am not at all jealous that writings of mine should be current under your name. On the contrary, I have heard of the adventures of my little story not without satisfaction, but it would be a gracious act on your part to reinstate the author of the story into the rights of which he has been dispossessed by a continuation of strange circumstances. Tolstoy responded, thus, It was only through your letter that I learned it had been circulated under my name, and I deeply regret it. 
not only that such a falsehood was allowed to pass unchallenged, but also the fact that it really was a falsehood. For I should be very happy were I the author of this tale. It is one of the best products of national wisdom, and ought to be bequeathed to all mankind, like the Odyssey, the History of Joseph, and Shakyamuni. When Tolstoy inquired into the origins of the story, Karas replied with, I wish to say that the story Karma originated in my mind, while I was compiling the Gospel of Buddha from the various sources of Buddhist literature. I was full of the subject, and the story dawned on me just like an inspiration. There are remnants of Buddhist thought in it, but it is very difficult for me to trace them to their proper source. One can only but appreciate the great irony of Karas taking offense to the spider's web being attributed to Tolstoy, when he himself had adapted a Christian original, with even now his name being all but forgotten in relation to Akutagawa's own adaptation. Overall, however, in relation to the spider's thread, I think it should strike us how quick we are to assume a foreign-coded Aesop to be genuine, without understanding or realizing if the familiar theme is actually appropriate to the text. I, for one, was first familiar with Akutagawa's story, assuming it was of a Buddhist origin, only becoming aware of the original Onion Tale later, and seeing how it really does more resemble Christian sensibilities. Tolstoy was even struck by how a Buddhist text revealed such powerful Christian truths, unaware that it was built upon a Christian foundation to begin with, the original residing in that book that he couldn't finish. One can only but wonder if Tolstoy, upon finishing the brothers Karamazov, later realized that the striking clearness was in his hands the whole time, from a contemporary Russian Orthodox author. But at the same time, how fascinating it is that the detail of Christian morality can so seamlessly pass into different cultural frameworks, and we still hearken to it, even if that morality doesn't quite fit into the same framework, such as is the case of the damnation of Kandata in Buddhism. <laughs> ¶¶